So thank you, Cynthia, and thank you, Anne, for setting the stage. And thank you, um, Baba and uh, Patrick, to invite me. So you guys are falling asleep, and I'm just waking up. <laughs> we also will shift gears as I'm a geochemist. So bear with me. My point is that at the end, we should have an understanding of what we talk about. I'm going to jump in right, right away. We will talk about isotopes. And the one thing you need to remember is my finger. It's fingerprint of the source. That's the one thing. And the second thing, it's a time integrated signature. For instance, in this diagram where we have strontium versus lead 206, we have the time integrated signature of rubidium-87 decaying in strontium-87 and uranium-238 in lead-206. Time integrated, it's million, if not billions of years. The fingerprint of the mantle source, and the point I want to make here is that the mantle is, the deep mantle is very heterogeneous, but you don't cover everything. There are some systematics. And what we'll focus on is on a Y and a parallel with Kerguelen. And there is a reason to make this parallel. You guys all know this, subducting slabs go down and they bring down heterogeneous material. Whatever, all kinds of lithologic compositions are brought down. And if we do some calculation, mass balance, for instance, sediments, there is between 0.3 and 0.7 cubic kilometers per year that subducts, which means that in 3 billion years, it's equal to subducting about a third of the volume of the modern continents. In the same way, oceanic crust much more subducts. It's about 60 billion cubic kilometers, which is 5% of the mantle mass. So it is significant, and as all this material is more heterogeneous and has wider um, elemental composition than what the mantle is, it's very, the mass balance works. And it's not surprising that the mantle is very heterogeneous. You have dynamic models for mantle heterogeneity where you combine what is recycled and what was primary heterogeneities, 4.6 billion years of mixing, that's the model of Balmer et al., and you end up with such models. Now, why do we want to focus on a why? And I'll be happy to talk extensively about that after. I don't want to go into too much details about why a why is actually very different from all the other mantle plumes. It has the largest magma flux. It's one of the best studied, and paradoxically, there is a lot more to know. It has a deep mantle origin, and we can advocate about that. And it's also the first documented occurrence of double cheats. Hawaii behaves also differently from the other mantle plumes. If you go from the distance from Kilauea, you go back in time, you actually have an increase in, in volume flux of magma to, as you become younger, which is the opposite of the big plume head model. And the younger it is, the higher the increase is. To give you a perspective, catch the diagram, all I want you to remember is that from the bottom of the ocean is Hawaii is taller than Mount Everest. It's the, the Mauna Loa is the tallest, is the largest volcanoes, and it's also the tallest mountain on Earth. So Hawaii has been documented as showing two geographical chain of volcanoes. This has puzzled us for years. And the first observation was the milestone study of Abu Shamir et, et al. that shows that these two chains have distinct isotopic signature. They're 50 kilometers away, they're the same mantle plume, so how come they have different signature? Then we did way more data. This has about 110 data focusing mostly on the big island and the anomalies here in Koolo. Here, it's all the sheet lavas, about 600 data points. The main point is that the dichotomy is preserved, different signature. So that's the same data set, and I just want to emphasize things 
a little more is the structure of these difference. These are individual lines to each volcano. And you can see that for the Kea side of things, they all intersect around the KIM member, which is up there. While for the lower side of things, they basically all rotate around the average composition of Mauna Loa. So that tells us something about the source of these lava. This diagram, again, we kilometers away from Kiloea. This is like age from today to 5 million years. Radiogenic lead, which is a measure of this difference um, on either side of the line. These are average of each volcano with two standard deviation. Two points here. The two trends are different isotopically. They also different in heterogeneity. You can see that the two standard deviations are smaller on the Kea side of things than on the lower side of things. Now, if we put that into a broader perspective, you're all familiar with this distribution of the two LLSVP, and more critically, Hawaii is here at the limit, northern limit of the Pacific LLSVP. This is how we came up with this idea that the explanation for, or the origin for the difference in composition between Loa and Kea comes from the fact that the Loa is on the side of the Pacific LLSVP. Since then, these occurrences of two chains, two compositional chains of volcanoes has been shown in Samoa, in the Marquesas, Society Islands, the Galapagos. So this is not limited to Hawaii. So far, we were just in the Pacific. You see the same thing in the Atlantic, where you have a difference between Tristan and Gough, which is also nicely reflected in isotopic signature. So one thing, and that's going to connect to what Anne said, if we look at Hawaii here, and I'm only focusing on shield lavas, because I want to compare apples with apples. You have Hawaii here. What's interesting, the yellow diamonds here are Pitcairn. So this trend are the two hotspots that are above the Pacific LLSVP. This trend here is Kerguelen and Tristan on the extreme ends of the African LLSVP. So the interpretation I put forward is that these two LLSVPs have different isotopic signature. They have different composition, and as a result, different isotopic signature. And I would argue that they also have different ages. So how can we move forward? We need to break some boundaries. And take a little time to look at that. <laughs> Those boundaries are actually, there is, a ter oops, sorry. there is a thermal barrier here. But I start to find that all these boundaries are actually more difficult to cross today than they were 10 years ago. And I can't be put in the lab hats, but I'm breaking that boundaries because I go like, I like the others. So let's go back to Hawaii because there are still many questions. And we still, again, only on the shield lavas. And the islands I'm going to focus on are these, Kohala, Aleakala, and then we'll go back to Koholo. And what I'll show you is that a lot is happening around Maui Noi. Maui Noi is the name of the big complex with all these islands. Why do I want to focus on that? There were a few things I didn't like in this plot. I was always annoyed by this group of island, West Maui, East Molokai, you can see here. They have some of the lowest radiogenic lead. The same way, Koolo has a very steep slope, which doesn't intersect with anything. And finally, Kohala intersects the boundary. And it's one of the rare islands doing that so strongly. 
So this is the same data pond and the previous diagram. Exactly the same, except that I color coded them differently. We have Kea in red, Loa in light blue, and Rich Loa in dark blue, and West Maui, East Maui in orange. Statistically, they are different. I did all kinds of discriminating analysis. They do not intersect. Now, when we look at Kohala, which is here, Maui, West Maui is here, East Molokai is there, Kohala is this orange blue, Aleakala, which is in between Maui and Kohala, plots there. And statistically, they belong to Kohala and not to Kea. So what does that mean? The, the lines here are completely different. What does that mean in terms of structure of the plume? This is another isotopic system, just to show you that it works in all isotopic systems. Lead is more discriminating, but the other isotopic systems show the same. So if we transfer this information to the map, this is what we get. Lower composition occupied the vast majority of the islands, so that's five million years, and rich lower is limited to a tiny time period. Transitional Kea is what I call Maui, Kohala, Aleakala, and then Kea. So it's more complicated than just the big, sharp difference between the two. And what do we do with that? Again, if we plot this data versus the distance from Kilauea and a measure of the difference with hydrogenic lead, I think it's simpler if you take the averages. You have clearly a trend where LOA is still way more heterogeneous, but transitional Kea appear here and merge into Kea. What do we do with that? Well, the first, we look at some of the modeling that Cynthia did, and all I want to emphasize here is this comparison here, the distance in kilometer and the predicted geochemical donation for a central volcano over the last 150 kilometers. So this is, here we have 540 kilometers, since your modeling is here. So there is some comparison. How can we relate that to the source? If we go back to this model, what I'm putting forward is that it's not two end members, but basically, a gradation that is perpendicular to the border of the ULVZ of the Pacific LLSVP. And if we do a cross section here, that's what we're seeing. So we're looking for the top. It's obviously a conceptual model. It's, the boundaries are probably way more wiggly than what my diagram is. And the thickness of the black lines here represents the relative volumes of these. Um, individual components. Kea samples the ambient Pacific mantle, and LOA shows its enriched characteristic because it's tapping some of the heterogeneities in the LLSVP. So that summarizes what I just said. The key question is, that's just the last five million years. What happens for the rest of the Hawaiian plume history, that is the Emperor Simons and the Hawaiian Ridge. So we talk, I'm just, I've just focused on this. We have another 40 million years of activity here and 82 day. And that's also the Hawaiian Ridge is when you start having an increase in volume flux and it's really becoming exponential when you reach the island. What does that mean? So the Hawaiian Ridge is this important feature it's, I don't think I'm going to run through the whole movie, but it's to give you a perspective. First, everything has subsided, so you don't have continu a continuous ridge. You have all these individual seamounts. Volumetri they, volumetrically, they quite, they're still quite significant. Now, we have a problem, and it's the following. 
Up to this study that I'm going to talk about, there were no data, no lead data, no high precision lead and no data period on the Hawaiian ridge and very little strontium and neodymium data. While there is some data here for the emperor part of the chain to a no DP leg. Luckily, we could find samples in collection and what you have here is distance from kilo A versus H. You can see the nice evolution which simply corresponds to the movement of the, Hawaii, the Pacific plate over the Hawaiian mantle plume. The problem we have now, it's actually a very good news for the environment, is that President Bush uh, created a huge marine national monument which cover all this. So none of these islands can be sampled. And about a month ago or two months ago, President Obama multiplied this by five. Now, all this is not accessible. And I'm not giving samples away because they're not very big. <laughs> so we're back to our same diagram. Let, let. We have the boundary between Loa and Kea, and here I've just put the two big volcanoes, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa. And the data points here, the diamonds, are the Hawaiian ridge. The triangles are the Emperor Simons. This is the main part of Lauren Harrison's PhD thesis, and it's impressed in EPSL. So at first you'll say, well, most of this data looks like Kea like the Emperor Simons actually all are on the Kea side. But if we plot this data versus age, let's focus right now on the hydrogenic lead, Emperor Simons, and then you go to the Northwest Hawaiian Ridge, you see an increase in hydrogenic lead. The boundary between Loa and Kea is about here at 0.95. And then on the islands, you have way more variation. So, emperor, low output, small variation. Northwest Hawaiian ridge, you have a dramatic increase the last 30 million years. So you're basically gaining a lower composition. And if we look at the other axis, the estimate volume flux, you can see that it's wiggling, no major variation during the emperor Simon time period and then it increases and increases more with time. You see various models here. They vary by a, a range of magnitude, but they all show the same thing. Doesn't matter what the absolute numbers are, the volume flux gains. And so an XY plot where you put the estimated volume flux versus hydrogenic lead, this is what you see. Emperor Simon's Northwest Hawaiian Ridge, and then it breaks down among the groups that I showed you when we focus on the island. So how did we interpret that? We refer again to some of the modeling of, of Stinsia. The ambient Pacific mantle provides the Kea source. The lower source is against the LLSVP, and then with time, the Hawaiian mantle plume is tapping the lower source. So how did we do that in our model? So starting Pacific LLSVP, lower mantle, the ultra low velocity zone. During the Hawaiian plume formation, it's only tapping the deep Pacific mantle. And same thing for the whole time period of the Emperor Simons, just Kea composition. Just after the bend, you start having some intermittent lower composition, mostly because the two are against each other and the ultra low velocity zone is being sampled. That's for the whole evolution of the Northwest Hawaiian Ridge. And for the last, the time period of the, the archipelago, lower is becoming volumetrically pro proeminent and, and dominates the composition. So our conclusion is that the mantle source for Hawaii is actually way more heterogeneous than what we thought. 
The Hawaiian mantle plume is zoned along a compositional gradient that is perpendicular to the edge of the LLSVP. The lower composition sampled the Pacific LLSVP, hence the EM1 signature, and the larger heterogeneity. And also, because of the difference with Kerguelen, which is the strongest EM1, we're implying that the Pacific LLSVP and the African LLSVP have different composition. And finally, the Hawaiian mantle plume source components refresh and grade into an out of existence on a much smaller time scale than previously thought. So I want to finish by thank you, thanking you for your attention and thanking my collaborator and also all my students who were very uh, articulate in, in uh, doing all this. Thank you.